Welcome back to part two, linked lists. One problem with using arrays to implement our list is that resizing and copying the array can potentially be very expensive, especially if our list grows very large. In fact, the cost of resizing the array can be linearly related to the number of elements in it. As an alternative solution, we could instead implement a linked list. Here's a graphical representation of a linked list. Each element is stored in a node, and each node is linked together. That is, each node stores two things an element and a reference to the next node. The list itself consists of only a single reference to the first node, called the head of the list. The end of the list is correspondingly referred to as the tail, represented here using a null reference. In contrast to array-based lists, a linked list has no fixed size and there's no resizing of an array. Operations in a linked list, such as adding or removing elements, only involve shuffling the node references around. This does come at a different cost, though. In particular, since there's no array, the nodes are not stored contiguously in memory. We do not have random access to a particular element. If we want to retrieve a particular element, we need to start at the head and traverse the list of nodes until we get to the one that we want. This can potentially be very expensive. We also have different corner cases to think about and handle when implementing our operations. There may be several variations on a retrieval method that we could implement. To keep it simple, we'll consider the same basic index-based retrieval method that we implemented with our previous list. The basic idea, as mentioned before, is that we start at the head element. To traverse the list, we'll simply keep track of the current node and update it in a loop to the current node's next node. Our loop terminates once we've found the node that we're looking for, or we've reached the end of the list. In general, this can be any condition, but for an index-based retrieval method, we'll keep a simple counter. Let's design our basic list and implement this idea in Java. First, we'll need to design a node class to hold our element and reference to the next node. We'll design it off the bat to be parameterized so it can hold any type of element. Let's add some basic methods including a constructor, getters, and setters. We'll also add a convenience method that allows us to tell if the node has a next node or not. We'll also include a toString method. Now we can create our list which will simply hold a single reference to the head node. I'll also include a constructor and our index-based retrieval method. Now to implement this method. We'll write a simple for loop that iterates through the list to the node at the given index. We first create a node that references the current node and initialize it to the head. Our for loop will update it at each iteration. Once we have the node, we can return the element stored in it. We still don't have any index bounds error handling like we did with our array base list. We have two options here. We could add logic to our loop to check to see if there's a next node or not, or we could implement a convenience method that computes the size of the list. Let's do that now.
This will work, but it seems a bit inefficient. Every time we need to compute the size of a list, we have to traverse through every single node until we get to the end. In particular, when executing an index-based retrieval method, we'll end up traversing the list twice, once to compute the size and do the error checking, and again to actually find the element. It would be more efficient if we simply keep track of the size and do the bookkeeping as we add or remove elements. Let's make that change now. We cannot yet test this method as we've not implemented an add method, so we'll hold off for now. Inserting an element into a linked list involves creating a new node and shuffling some references around. Of course, the first step is to find the point in the list where you want to insert the node. Again, this could be based on some given index or a more complex criterion. For now, we'll go ahead and assume that we've taken care of that detail and suppose that we want to insert a new node containing 42 between these two nodes. The first step is to create a new node containing the value that we want to insert. We then make this new node point to the current node's next node. Finally, we make the current node point to our new node. From the perspective of the list, the new node is now linked with the rest. Let's implement this process in our list. As with our other list, we'll implement an index-based insertion method. We'll take care of the index checking and error handling first. Next, we'll create the new node. If we want to insert this new node at any given index, we'll actually need the node right before that. So we'll want the node at index minus one. Initially, we might think to reuse our index-based retrieval method to do this. The problem is that this method actually returns an element stored in the node, not the node itself. This gives us an opportunity to generalize our previous method to return the node at a given index. Let's copy and modify this method to do that. Arguably, this presents a leaky abstraction. Having a public method that allows somebody to access the internal representation of our list exposes our implementation details. There's a good design argument here that this should be made into a private method. Now, we don't want to repeat ourselves, so we'll refactor our previous index-based find method to use this new, more general method. Now back to our insert method. We'll want to get the node at index minus one. Once we have the relevant node, we can shuffle our references around. We make the new node point to the current node's next node. and we make the current node point to our new node. Now let's test our methods. To help, I'll quickly implement a two-string method so that we can see the contents of the list and adapt the same ad hoc testing methods from before.
Looks like it failed. It failed because we forgot to take into account one of the corner cases, namely the scenario in which we insert into an empty list. With an empty list, inserting at index 0 involves alternative operations because there's no node at index 0. We end up with a null reference, and calling next results in a null pointer exception because there's no node at index 0. So attempting to get the previous node at index minus 1 results in an exception. Even if the list had elements, inserting at index 0 means that we would end up getting the node at index, index minus 1, resulting in the same error. Moreover, we would necessarily need to update the head reference to the new node in either case. Thus, let's handle this corner case separately. This logic takes care of both the case when we have an empty list and when there are elements in the list but we want to insert at index 0. Let's test it again. It works. We have 30, 20, and 10. But there's still a bug here. Let's go ahead and try to add another element. At the end of the list. 3 is out of bounds even though there are 3 elements in the list and we're trying to add to the end of the list. This is because we forgot to do our bookkeeping. We incremented the size down here, but we failed to do it for our corner cases. And now it works. Again, testing cannot be emphasized enough. What about a removal operation? Again, the first step is to find the node that you want to remove. In this case, we'll assume that we want to remove the node containing 42, reversing our previous operation. We would actually need to find the node immediately before it in order to shuffle the references properly. To do this, removing the node simply involves updating the next node reference of the previous node to 42's next, like so. From the perspective of the list, the node has been removed, as it cannot be traversed in any meaningful way. Languages that support automated garbage collection will clean up the removed node. In languages that don't have automatic garbage collection, it would fall to us to clean up the memory associated with that node. Let's implement this now. First, we'll handle the index checking. We'll reuse our convenience method to get the node that we wish to remove as well as the one previous to it. Before we continue, let's think about this for a second. By making two calls to our index-based retrieval method, we're potentially doing twice as much work as we need to. If the list is very large, say n elements, where n is a million, we would potentially perform two million node traversal operations. This is unnecessary since if we get the previous node, we can simply get the current node by making only one more traversal. Let's improve our code to do this. Now we can shuffle the references around. And let's test it. We should expect the list as before, 30, 20, 10, 42, but after this, we should remove 10. Of course, we'd want to write a lot more test cases and conditions, such as removing from the tail element and internal nodes as well. 
We could add a lot more functionality to our implementation, including convenience methods for adding elements to the head or to the tail of the list. If we were to support the second operation, it might be wise to keep track of the tail element as well as the head element in the list for better efficiency. With respect to Java, we could implement the iterable interface, which would allow a user to iterate over the elements in our list using an enhanced for loop. We could also support batch methods to add or remove multiple elements with one method call. And of course, we should do a lot more testing to give greater assurance that our implementation is bug-free. There are several variations on linked lists that you can also explore. This, for example, is a circularly linked list. Rather than the tail element referring to a null pointer, it wraps around back to the head node. This could potentially simplify some of the operations. This is a doubly linked list in which each node not only has a next reference, but also a reference back to the previous node. This enables us to traverse the list in reverse. Again, it has the potential to simplify some of our operations, but more bookkeeping is required for the basic operations. One of the main criticisms of linked lists is that in practice, they can be slower than array-based lists. This is because the nodes in a linked list are not stored contiguously in memory. Iterating through a linked list may lead to a lot of cache misses, necessitating a lot of page loads in memory that can be slow. An array, since it's stored contiguously, would not be as susceptible to this problem as large chunks of the array are loaded all at once. Thus, a hybrid approach to solve this problem may be to use unrolled linked lists. Each node, rather than holding a single element, may hold an array of elements, where the size can be tuned for a particular system. Each array node is still linked to another array node, thus giving a sort of hybrid array slash linked list. Array-based lists and linked lists offer different advantages and disadvantages. Either variation offers a better abstraction over plain arrays, and each has their appropriate applications as we'll see later. Though we went through some basic implementations to illustrate the core concepts, in practice you would use a library or other built-in implementation, which are going to be better designed, optimized, and well-tested. In Java, for example, the collections library provides a list interface and several implementations, including an array list and a linked list, 